Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Minor Issues Podcast. I'm Mark Thornton at the Mises Institute. Well, John Maynard Keynes was an English economist who spawned a revolution in economic thinking that broke out in Britain from a cesspool of socialist thinking, creating a tidal wave of anti-economics that overwhelmed and dominated economics professions worldwide, and it's known as Keynesian economics. His experience as an investor is very instructive to his mindset and the unfortunate revolution that he brought to the world. Most economists now eschew the label Keynesian economics, but that is only natural given the past wreckage of its failures. The components of Keynes's own thinking and writing have been absorbed, interpreted, often beyond recognition, and ultimately rejected as false or even dangerous. Nevertheless, when the body of Keynes' thought has been picked clean of the tissue, the skeleton that remains dominates the profession and even popular thinking. The government is now in control of the economy. When Keynes was being educated at Socialist Cambridge University, the real world was still one where laissez-faire dominated and controlled, and it had succeeded in lifting up the working class and built a mighty engine of capitalism, and government was considered a separate and distinct entity subject to its own rules and regulations, such as the gold standard and the balanced budget. Keynes published his famous book, A General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money, in 1936, and he died in 1946, leaving the world with a fully bastardized Bretton Woods gold system, an embedded view of technocratic socialism, and the new macro view of economics that fully dominates schooling, education, propaganda, and policy today. By eliminating the teaching of economic thought, especially in graduate programs, the modern economist cannot really think in terms of anything else. The central bank, the Federal Reserve, and the Treasury Department manipulate the economy like puppets pulling on a string. Everything else, including microeconomics, is now just viewed as specializations, micro policy, or simply the main revenue from teaching principles classes at university. Economists may genu- genuflect to the free market as a necessary evil, but their real views are that the market has all sorts of imperfections and markets create all sorts of evils in the world. In a real sense, this is a disingenuous perspective that flies totally in the face of historical facts. The very idea that the government could be largely done away with and not be used to diagnose, treat, or cure the economy would be seen as ludicrous and send most newly minted economics PhDs into a mental meltdown. Keynes was the son of a professor and trained in mathematics. He was a wonder kid, publishing famous books on probability, economics, and politics. And he was a big player in international affairs and an important architect in redesigning the world monetary order away from the gold standard. In investing, Keynes has even been designated as one of the first experts in institutional investing in that he was directing large amounts of funds for institutional portfolios or endowments. Keynes was an active investor and his investment philosophy changed over time through trial and error. Keynes expert David Chambers showed that Keynes's experience as an investor was not, quote, one of unqualified success, end quote, noting that in the first decade, Keynes failed to even match market returns. And for a crucial 
quote, period of three years in the late 1920s, he actually was substantially behind the market, end quote. It appears that Keynes invested institutional money in small value stocks and that he tried to use his understanding of the business cycle to engage in market timing. Now, both of those approaches are now largely rejected by professional institutional investors and led Keynes to produce very poor performance for his clients. Timing the market and picking winners from amongst small stocks takes either genius and a lot of hard work or a super large ego. In Keynes's case, it was surely ego rather than genius that was at work here. He was an extremely self-confident individual. After the stock market crashes and the Great Depression began, Keynes began work on his magnum opus, The General Theory, and he thereafter hid under an investment philosophy of diversification and buy and hold strategies, which did not really help his investment returns during the 1930s. But notice this, the timing of all this. One, his investment philosophy failed both before 1929 and after 1929. The the Great Depression hits in the early 1930s, and Keynes begins writing his most influential book, which is published in 1936. The hallmark of the book and what generally moves the entire economic model for Keynes is his assumption of, quote, animal spirits, telling investors and capitalists what to do next. According to Keynes expert Justin Walsh, quote, Keynes would utilize the insights gained from his roller coaster ride on the financial markets to develop a revolutionary theory that accounted for the booms and busts of modern economics. A central contention of Keynes' radical thesis would be that financial markets were not always efficient and that the upheavals in the world of money could lead to disturbances in the real economy. End quote. James, Keynes's general theory was supposed to overcome capitalism and its internal mechanisms of caution and stability would have to be replaced with an unabashed optimism and utopianism of a technocratic bureaucratic future where bureaucrat economists would chart the course of the economy and even be in charge of the wind that propelled its sails. What Keynes failed to appreciate was that central banks were already in charge of the world of money and were already the cause of great disturbances in the real economy. Moreover, he seems not to have realized that governments were the real cause of widespread destruction during World War I and its aftermath, as well as the massive increase in the size of governments, spending, and debt. How anyone could fail to notice the connection between these events and the post-World War I monetary and economic problems in the United Kingdom is beyond explanation. John Maynard Keynes, by all accounts, was an egomaniac, No one doubts that he was a socialist or that his book, The General Theory, calls for all-round government control of the economy or for the socialization of investment. However, it is vital that we recognize that this ego drove his investment philosophy and that his dismal investment performance is something he blames on the free market and that he in turn advocated socialist investment and economic policies as a result. Here is one of Keynes' most remembered quotes, where he was disparaging the classical economists such as Adam Smith 
in John Stuart Mill. Quote, practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influence are usually the slaves of some defunct economist. Madmen in authority who hear voices in the air are distilling their frenzy from some academic scribbler of a few years back, John Maynard Keynes. It would appear that we are now the slaves of the view of a, quote, defunct economist, John Maynard Keynes, and that our madmen in authority, such as Federal Reserve Chairman Jay Powell and economist Paul Krugman are distilling their frenzy from none other than Keynes himself.